following video deals with mature subject matter which may not be suitable for younger children. Viewer discretion is advised. Hi, I'm Daisy Boyden and you're watching Hammers and Peters. In the first two instalments of this series, we explored 13 missing persons cases from the southern interior of British Columbia, Canada. Last week, we looked at some of the native legends surrounding this mysterious region, which cast an eerie light on the unsolved disappearances that have taken place there. In this video, we're going to investigate five more disappearances that have occurred in the area very recently at the northeastern vertex of the British Columbia Triangle. Whether or not the disturbing native legends surrounding the British Columbia Triangle have any bearing upon the vanishes endemic to the region is a matter of conjecture. Perhaps the traditions of the interior sailors hold the keys to the secrets of the Middle Fraser Basin, or perhaps the unsolved disappearances that have taken place there all have rational explanations. Whatever the case, people continue to vanish in the region to this very day, and are doing so at an unprecedented rate. Over the past few years, two distinct waves of disappearances have swept through BC's interior plateau, one involving only men and the other involving only women. The male disappearances are concentrated around the eastern Fraser watershed in an area roughly 40 miles or 64 kilometers southwest of Kamloops. We'll investigate these disappearances in the final installment of this series. The female disappearances, on the other hand, are concentrated in northern Okanagan country, roughly 55 miles or 90 kilometers southeast of Kamloops, at the eastern edge of one of the cluster points identified by David Politis. In a 19-month period between 2016 and 2017, five women from rural areas around the city of Salmon Arm mysteriously vanished. Although the RCMP officers investigating the disappearances have stated there is no evidence indicating the cases are connected, local media outlets, women's advocacy groups, and some of the victims' family members are certain that the women were victims of foul play, and many seem to be levying their accusations against a single suspect. The first of the ladies to disappear was 27-year-old Caitlin Brandy Potts, who lived in a rural area just east of the tiny city of Enderby, located about 9 miles or 15 kilometers southeast of Salmon Arm. Although Caitlin did not necessarily disappear from the same tiny corner of British Columbia from which the other four women vanished, her name has become inextricably linked with theirs on account of the fact that her residence was located within the same 13-kilometer radius in which the other disappearances occurred. Caitlin Potts was a member of the Samson First Nation, a Cree Indian band from the community of Hobima, now called Mesquasis, located south of Edmonton, Alberta. In late 2015, Caitlin left Alberta and relocated to Enderby, where she lived with a man named Jason Hanadiak, with whom she had once lived back in Edmonton. Although both the media and members of Caitlin's family have identified Hanadiak as Caitlin's boyfriend, Hanadiak himself has publicly denied that allegation. By all accounts, Potts and Hanadiak had a turbulent relationship, which was punctuated by several temporary separations. Back in August 2014, when Potts and Hanadiak were both living in Edmonton, Hanadiak was accused of assaulting Potts with a weapon, a charge of which an Albertan court later found him guilty. Sometime after the incident, Potts took up residence in a women's shelter in Salmon Arm. There are conflicting accounts as to where Caitlin was staying at the time of her disappearance. Some claim that she had moved back in with Hanadiak, who lived on a rural property just east of Enderby, while others contend that she was living in Salmon Arm with a roommate whom she had met at the women's shelter. On Sunday, February 21st, 2016, at about 1.30 in the afternoon, a security camera captured Caitlin Potts entering the Hudson's Bay store in the Orchard Park Mall in the southern Okanagan city of Kelowna, located about 50 miles or 80 kilometers south of Enderby. Caitlin's presence in the Orchard City, as Kelowna is sometimes called, was not unusual, as she often traveled throughout British Columbia and Alberta, and was known to have connections in the area. 
The following day, on February 22nd, Caitlin sent a Facebook message to her younger sister, Cody. Cody lived in Edmonton, and Caitlin planned to pay her a visit. In her message, Caitlin claimed to have found someone on Kijiji, a Canadian classified advertising website, who agreed to drive her to Calgary, Alberta, the first leg of the journey to Edmonton. That was the last time any of Caitlin's family members ever heard from her. Eight days later, on March 1st, Caitlin's mother, Priscilla, reported Caitlin's disappearance to the Vernon North Okanagan RCMP. On March 21st, 20 days after the missing person report was filed, the RCMP posted an official alert on their website in which they stated that, quote, the RCMP Major Crimes Unit is now assisting Vernon North Okanagan RCMP with the investigation of POTS, unquote. The Southeast District MCU's involvement in the case seemed to indicate that the Mounties had reason to believe there was a criminal element to Potts' disappearance. Three months later, Priscilla Potts, having lost faith in the RCMP's investigation, contacted the Shushwap Nation and the Okanagan Nation Alliance in BC and implored them to conduct their own private search for her daughter. The First Nations responded to her entreaty by searching the woods around Enderby, Easterly Mabel Lake, the Shushwap River, and the northerly community of Grindrod for any sign of the missing woman. Their efforts were in vain. In April 2017, ten months after Caitlin Potts' disappearance, RCMP Media Relations Officer Staff Sergeant Annie Linto publicly stated that the RCMP believed that Potts was likely murdered. Linto concluded her press release with the cryptic words, quote, Investigators do not believe Caitlin Potts left the Okanagan before her death. Previous reports that she was traveling to Calgary, Alberta, have not been substantiated." Unquote. The RCMP's statement accords with another unsubstantiated rumor that Potts was dropped off outside Enderby by the mysterious man with whom she may have caught a ride in Kelowna. To date, Caitlin Potts' body has not been found, and her fate remains a mystery. On April 27, 2016, nearly two months after Caitlin Potts' disappearance, a 32-year-old woman named Ashley Simpson disappeared after leaving her boyfriend's travel trailer on Yankee Flats Road, a rural back road located about 10 miles or 16 kilometers east of Enderby. Originally from St. Catharines, Ontario, Ashley Simpson began working as a seasonal assistant cook and receptionist at two hotels in northeastern British Columbia in 2014. The first of these establishments was the Sasquatch Crossing Lodge, a lonely stopping place on the Alaska Highway, a two-hours drive northwest of Fort St. John, while the other was the affiliated Buffalo Inn, a slightly more luxurious establishment located five minutes away from Sasquatch Crossing. She worked alongside her father, a professional cook named John Simpson, while her boyfriend Derek Favell worked for an oil field service company across the highway from Sasquatch Crossing Lodge. Sometime in early 2016, Ashley and her boyfriend drove south down the BC Highway 97, the longest highway in the province, living out of Favelle's travel trailer. They eventually stopped on Yankee Flats Road outside the city of Enderby, at the rural home of Favelle's old friend, Brent Cox. Cox was a single father of three who lived in a house on Yankee Flats Road with his children. At Favelle's request, Cox allowed the couple to temporarily park their mobile home on his property and stay there while they figured out their next move. On April 27, 2016, following a trip to a waterfall northwest of Salmon Arm called Siphon Falls, Ashley Simpson had a loud argument with Derek Favell on the subject of money. The fight was so audible that Cox, who was trying to put his kids to bed, came out of his house and asked the couple to quiet down. According to Favell, the argument ended when Simpson stormed off in a rage. Favell himself reportedly retreated to the trailer to cool down. Derek Favell fell asleep in the camper without seeing his girlfriend again that night. When I woke up in the morning, he later told the press, I thought Brent had driven her into town, or taken her down to someone's to go spend a couple days. She had done that before, where she had taken off at night, and we had to get someone to go pick her up because she was walking. I kind of figured that she had done the same thing." Unquote. Between 7.30 and 8 o'clock that morning, Favell received two texts from Ashley, in which she stated that their relationship was over. 
She also informed Favelle that she planned to head to her parents' home in Niagara-on-the-Lake, Ontario, and work with her father again. But as she didn't have the means to travel there by bus, she would probably have to hitchhike. That was the last time anyone ever heard from Ashley Simpson. Sometime after Ashley's departure, Favelle became concerned that his ex-girlfriend was not responding to his text messages, and texted one of her cousins to see if she had heard from her. The cousin, who had not had any recent contact with Simpson, alerted Ashley's mother, Cindy. Alarmed by her daughter's uncharacteristic silence, Cindy Simpson subsequently reported Ashley's disappearance to the RCMP. On May 19, 2016, three weeks after her disappearance, the RCMP Southeast District Major Crimes Unit became involved in Simpson's missing persons case, an indication that the Mountie suspected that Simpson may have fallen victim to foul play. In a press release, RCMP Media Relations Officer Corporal Dan Moskaluk stated that, quote, The investigation into Ashley's disappearance has not come up with much information to date. Normally with missing persons matters, a good percentage of them are located in short order. We need to get information on their whereabouts or information as to where they were last seen. With the case of Ashley Simpson, the lack of information and leads leads us to believe that foul play may be a contributing factor in her disappearance." Unquote. One cold morning later that month, a local woman named Kendra Toner and one of her friends drove up a remote, dead-end logging road in the Larch Hills, east of Canoe, B.C., a rural community located just northeast of Salmon Arm, which hugs the southern shore of Shushwap Lake's southeastern arm. The friends planned to hunt grouse. Near the end of the road, Toner claimed to have stumbled upon, quote, a pile of clothing on the ground, lots of pink shirts, jeans. There were CDs, makeup, etc., unquote. Among the miscellanea was a piece of mail with Ashley Simpson's name on it. After searching the vicinity of the articles for any sign of Ashley, of whose disappearance they had heard on TV news, Toner and her friend headed back down the mountain and informed the RCMP of their discovery. About a month later, the friends returned to the area and found the belongings in the same spot, although they now lay scattered in an even more haphazard fashion than before, and appeared to Toner as if they had been run over many times by some sort of vehicle. The envelope with Simpson's name on it was one of the only items that appeared to be missing. The friends left the area with the impression that the RCMP had neglected to follow up on the lead with which they had furnished them. In early October 2016, Ashley Simpson's case took another strange and troubling turn. Investigators found the missing woman's driver's license in the tank of a sewage vacuum truck used by the Sasquatch Crossing Lodge in northeastern British Columbia, Ashley's former place of employment. I think years ago, Ashley told me somebody stole her ID, John Simpson told reporters when they asked him for his reaction to the news. And why the vac truck? I know the vac truck empties into a lagoon, where the ID card would never be found again. That leaves us to wonder a lot of questions, of course." Unquote. On July 19, 2016, less than three months after Ashley Simpson's disappearance, 46-year-old Deanna Wirtz, whose case we examined earlier in this series, vanished without a trace while hiking in the hills outside her home. Deanna's residence was located just two doors down the road from Brian Cox's property. The next woman to disappear in northern Okanagan country was an 18-year-old Vernon girl named Tracy Genero. According to her father, Darcy Genero, Tracy had fallen in with a bad crowd in her early teens and made some poor decisions, becoming addicted to heroin, and in order to support her habit, descending into the shadowy underworld of the escort industry. After surviving a devastating car accident that nearly left her paralyzed, she began to turn her life around. She worked hard to overcome her addiction and began volunteering at the Vernon SPCA, taking a preliminary step on a hopeful road to one day becoming a veterinarian. By the spring of 2017, she was well on her way to recovery. On May 29, 2017, a local man named Bob Zimmerman, who knew Tracy and had pushed her to get her life back on track, 
saw the 18-year-old climb into a white van in an alley outside of Vernon Bottle Depot. Aside from the vehicle's mysterious driver, Zimmerman was the last man known to have seen Tracy alive. Tracy's parents knew that something was terribly wrong when their daughter failed to contact them after a few days. Although Tracy had run away from home in the past, she had always regularly kept in touch with them to let them know that she was safe. In a later interview, Tracy's elder sister, Kyla, told reporters, quote, I knew that she would not have been out of contact with my mom this long, or my dad. The fact that she was, I knew something was wrong, unquote. Fearing for his daughter's safety, Darcy Genero informed the local RCMP of her disappearance. In later interviews, he claimed that he had to make three missing person reports before the Mounties publicized his daughter's case. A little over three months after Tracy Genero's disappearance, a 31-year-old mother of three named Nicole Bell went missing in her hometown of Malakwa, located about 10 miles northeast of the town of Sycamus, near the eastern shores of Shushwap Lake. Described as a soccer mom type, Bell vanished on Saturday, September 2, 2017, while her husband was away from home on a business trip. According to one vague report, she was scheduled, quote, to meet with an unknown male, unquote, on September 5th, three days after her disappearance. The RCMP subsequently tracked Bell's cell phone to a particular neighborhood in Salmon Arm, where they went door to door asking residents if they remembered anything suspicious taking place during the Labor Day weekend. Their efforts were for naught. Nicole Bell was never found, and her fate remains a mystery to this day. Interestingly, both Nicole Bell and Tracy Genero, at the time of their disappearances, were petite women with facial piercings who stood 4 foot 11. On October 19, 2017, the Vernon RCMP Southeast District Major Crimes Unit descended upon a 24-acre rural property about 9 miles east of Enderby, armed with heavy-duty equipment and a search warrant legally authorizing them to excavate the grounds. The property belonged to Wayne and Evelyn Sagmoen, a middle-aged couple who were popular with their neighbors, and who were famous in the regional cutting horse community, cutting being a rodeo sport in which the horseman separates individual cattle from the herd. A small crowd of locals from the surrounding acreages soon gathered outside the property, watching with curiosity and disconcertion as the police erected tents, trailers, fencing, and high-powered lights around the farmhouse. Dozens of Mounties began walking slowly through the open field by the barn, sifting through the grass with poles, while divers equipped in scuba gear waded into Silver Creek, a watercourse which runs through the property. By the time reporters arrived on the scene, the police were digging holes on the property with a backhoe. When questioned by the press, RCMP media spokesperson Corporal Dan Moskaluk said, quote, this investigative effort and execution of a search warrant is in relation to an ongoing investigation. No further information is being released at this time to ensure the integrity of the ongoing investigation." Unquote. Despite the Mounties' refusal to disclose the nature of said investigation, or the grounds on which they had obtained their warrant, the reporters who covered the incident noted that the Sagamoan property lay on Salmon River Road, a quiet country back road which runs parallel and adjacent to Yankee Flats Road on which both Deanna Wirtz and Ashley Simpson were last seen. The property's farmhouse was separated from the last known locations of both missing women by a mile-wide wooded hill. Naturally, the press suspected that the Mounties might be searching for the bodies of Wirtz and Simpson, and in no time, local newspapers throughout northern Okanagan country ran with stories in which these conjectures were implicitly voiced. The police responded to the rumors by phoning the families of the two missing women and informing them that the operation on Silver Creek Farm had nothing to do with their investigations into the disappearances of their loved ones. The Mounties resumed their mysterious operation the following day, on October 20th, 2017. Before going about their business, they arrested the son of the property's owner, a rough-looking 36-year-old pile-driving foreman named Curtis Wayne Sagmoen. Journalists subsequently interviewed some of the Sagmoans' neighbors and learned that Curtis Sagmoan had been staying with his parents at the time, as he often did between jobs. The interviewees described the pile driver as strange and quiet, 
yet generally pleasant and polite. Some suspected that he was addicted to crystal meth on account of his haggard appearance and missing teeth. The arrest of Curtis Wayne Sagamoan was related to an incident that occurred at the Silver Creek property two months earlier, on August 28, 2017. That incident was the latest episode in a succession of unsettling encounters between Sagmoan and various female escorts, which render the subsequent discovery on his parents' acreage all the more disturbing. Curtis Sagmoan's first clash with an escort occurred in his hometown of Maple Ridge, British Columbia, located at the easternmost end of the Greater Vancouver Regional District, on the northern shores of the Fraser River. In 2013, the 33-year-old pile driver was living alone in one of the townhouses that comprise the Kanaka Creek Estates, a neighborhood located near the city's southeastern edge. One cold winter night in January 2013, Sagmoan assaulted a female escort in his home, a charge to which he would later plead guilty. In a later reminiscence, one of Sagmoan's neighbors recalled hearing shrieking outside his house that night, and went out to investigate. He found Sagmoan standing over a screaming woman, who was cowering on the concrete, bleeding from her head. The woman pleaded for help, claiming that Sagmoan had struck her with a hammer. Sagmoan attempted to justify his actions by retorting that she had stolen his belongings. The escort survived her injuries, and later charged the pile driver with assault. Later that year, two different women were assaulted by what was presumably the same masked man on two different walking trails in southeastern Maple Ridge, both of which ran within a mile of Sagmoan's townhouse. The first assault took place on the morning of Thursday, November 7, 2013, when a man wearing a balaclava grabbed a young woman from behind on a wooded trail near 240th Street. The woman fought off her assailant and escaped without further incident. About two hours before the assault, another young woman had been accosted by a similar-looking man while walking to Samuel Robertson Technical School, which is located on 104th Avenue nearby. The man had asked the woman where she was going, but the student did not respond. Nineteen days later, on Tuesday, November 26th, a masked man assaulted another woman on the Vine Maple Trail in Kanaka Creek Regional Park, located about a half-mile northwest of the site of the previous incident. The description she gave of the man who attacked her was identical to that furnished by the November 7th victim, leading the local Ridge Meadows RCMP to suspect that both women were attacked by the same man. Some media outlets and women's advocacy groups have suggested that Curtis Sagamon might have been the masked man who perpetrated the Maple Ridge assaults on November 7th and November 26th, considering the close proximity of his residence to the crime scenes, as well as his subsequent criminal history. The profile that the RCMP created of the 2013 Maple Ridge attacker, however, calls this theory into question. According to the police, the attacker was a six-foot-tall Caucasian male in his 40s who wore medium-length dark hair. Curtis Sagmoan stands 5 foot 7 inches, has light brown hair which he routinely keeps closely cropped, and was 33 years old in 2013. Later that year, Sagmoan left Maple Ridge and moved on to his parents' property on Salmon River Road, where he lived out of a travel trailer. For several years, his only brushes with the law constituted a handful of minor driving offenses and a ticket he received in Terrace, B.C. for fishing illegally. Ominously, one of the vehicle infractions with which Sagmoan was charged occurred in Vernon, B.C. on May 29, 2017 the same day on which Tracy Genero was last spotted climbing into a stranger's van outside of Vernon Bottle Depot. An anonymous female escort has claimed that on July 1, 2017, Curtis Sagmoan assaulted her with a weapon near his parents' property on Salmon River Road. Eighteen days later, exactly one year after Deanna Wirtz disappeared from her home on Yankee Flats Road, Sagmoan solicited the services of another escort, whom he invited to his parents' acreage. Before his guest arrived, Sagmoan laid a homemade wooden spike belt across his parents' long dirt driveway. Predictably, the apparatus punctured the tires of the escort's jeep as she pulled up to the remote rural property. The woman immediately drove off and managed to make it to a repair shop where her tires were patched. She later charged Sagmoan for the damage he inflicted upon her vehicle, to which the pile driver pled guilty. On August 10, 2017, Sagmoan solicited the services of a third escort, whom he asked to meet him at his parents' property. 
The woman later claimed that, upon arriving at the acreage and finding the gate locked, she texted Sagmoen and asked him to let her in. The 36-year-old pile driver arrived shortly thereafter, driving an all-terrain vehicle, and asked the woman to follow him down a narrow dirt trail that led into the woods. The trail was too narrow to accommodate the car, and so, at Sagmoen's insistence, the woman got out of her own vehicle and climbed onto the back of the man's ATV. Sagmoen then offered the escort a drink from a bottle, which he claimed contained sipping booze. When she refused the beverage, Sagmoen allegedly pretended to take a sip of the liquor before slipping the bottle into his pocket. Sagmoen drove the woman down the rough dirt trail to the banks of Silver Creek. There, the escort demanded that she be paid for her services, whereupon Sagmoen suggested that they head to his trailer. With the escort riding behind him, Sagmoen drove back up the trail to the woman's car, opened the gate to his parents' property, and asked his guest to follow him in her own vehicle. The escort tried to do as requested, but couldn't advance up the driveway on account of the mud. While Sagmoen attempted to push the vehicle out of the rut into which it had sunk, a neighbor who was out for a walk happened upon the pair. I got the impression he wished I wasn't there, the man later said of Sagmoen while testifying in front of a Vernon jury. When it became clear that the woman's car would not budge, the escort got onto the back of Sagmoen's ATV once again and drove with him up the long dirt driveway through the woods. At a point on the trail near a steep cliff, Sagmoen's quad slowed to a stop. The pile driver claimed that his ATV appeared to have stopped working, but the escort believed that there was nothing wrong with the vehicle, and that Sagmoen had brought it to a stop intentionally. Feeling uneasy about the situation, the woman declared that she was going to head back to her car. As she walked back down the road, she heard Sagmoen's quad rev back to life. I thought he was just going to be a jerk and kick up some dust, the woman later testified, and I had moved to the edge to let him get by. Instead of going by me, he hit me square from behind, trying to hit me off the mountain. He hit me so hard I flipped over, and luckily I didn't lose consciousness." Unquote. The force of the impact reputedly broke the woman's tailbone, gave her a concussion, and knocked her shoes off her feet. Dazed, the woman picked herself up off the ground and looked at Sagmoen, whom she claimed was standing at the edge of the cliff, peering into the underbrush below, as if he expected to see her body lying there. He just tried to kill me, in my eyes, the woman said. I just wanted to get away from him as quickly as possible." Unquote. Sagmoen purportedly appeared startled when he saw the woman standing on the road behind the quad. He pleaded that he had run into her accidentally, and offered to pay her for her troubles. The woman proceeded to walk backwards down the hill towards her vehicle, never taking her eyes off her client. She got into her car and, after tricking the pile driver into believing that she would follow him to his trailer, drove home. Eighteen days later, on August 28, 2017, Sagmoen invited a fourth escort to his parents' acreage. Similar to her unfortunate predecessor, the woman later claimed that, as she drove up to the property in her grey Mazda, she found that the driveway was blocked by a closed gate. She got out of her vehicle and walked over to the gate to open it, when she heard some rustling in the bushes. Suddenly, a masked man emerged from some nearby foliage holding a shotgun. The frightened woman raced to her vehicle with a stranger in hot pursuit. She got into her car and began to back up, hoping to make a quick U-turn, when the man jammed the barrel of his gun through the open window. The woman frantically pushed the muzzle away from her, and in doing so, lost control of her vehicle. She crashed into a small bridge near the driveway, and, unable to drive away, slipped out of the passenger door, leaving her car running. In her haste, the woman kicked off her pink sandals and ran barefoot into some nearby brush. The terrified woman hid in the foliage until daybreak, before making her escape. I was afraid he was going to shoot me, she later said of the incident. I'm forever grateful that I'm not dead." Unquote. Bizarrely, for many months following the escort's harrowing experience, one of the torn pink sandals she had left behind could be seen hanging by a string from the property's address sign, eerily twisting in the breeze. The last escort to have a brush with Curtis Wayne Sagmoen reported her experience to the RCMP. The Mounties followed up on the report and paid the pile driver a visit on September 5, 2017. The police found methamphetamine on Sagmoen's person and detained him for a day at the Okanagan Correctional Center in Oliver, BC. The RCMP released the man the following day without laying charges. Shortly thereafter, 
They published a description of Sagamowin on their website, and issued a statement warning escorts to avoid taking any work on Salmon River Road. On October 20th, 2017, while the RCMP were searching his property, Curtis Wayne Sagmowen was arrested for the crimes he had allegedly committed on August 28th, and detained in the prison at Oliver. The following day, the police found a body of a young woman on his parents' property, buried in a shadow patch of grass at the edge of the woods. On November 1st, the RCMP publicly stated that the human remains they uncovered on the Sagamon property were those of 18-year-old Tracy Janaro, who vanished from Vernon on May 29th. The police also stated that they considered Tracy's death suspicious. For many Canadians, the revelation evoked the not-so-distant trials of Robert Willie Picton, Canada's most prolific serial killer, who disposed of his victims' bodies on his pig farm in Port Coquitlam, east of Vancouver, from 1983 to 2002. This comparison gave rise to rampant speculation that the bodies of Caitlin Potts, Ashley Simpson, Deanna Wirtz, and Nicole Bell were also buried on the Sagmo and Acreage, and that Curtis Wayne Sagamowen was a serial killer who preyed on vulnerable women in the northern Okanagan. To date, the RCMP have not charged Curtis Sagamowen with any offense related to the death of Tracy Janaro, and have repeatedly issued statements declaring that they are not aware of any evidence linking the pile driver to any of the missing persons cases in the Salmon Arm area. Nevertheless, certain segments of the Okanagan population remain convinced of his guilt. Members of a women's advocacy group called the Battered Women Support Services, most of whom are indigenous, have staged several protests outside the Sagmoan property, and have stood outside the Vernon Courthouse during his various trials holding posters on which the portraits of all five missing Okanagan women have been plastered. Family members of some of the missing women have personally searched the hills surrounding the Sagmoan property for their loved ones' remains and a non-profit search organization called Wings of Mercy has scoured the same area with drones in an attempt to help the bereaved find some closure. Even the RCMP, despite its reiterations that Sagmoen is not implicated in any of the disappearances of the five women from the northern Okanagan, continues to display a keen interest in the former pile driver. On October 2, 2020, the Mounties raided the Salmon River Road property a second time, during which Curtis Sagmoen allegedly assaulted RCMP Corporal Jerry Kovacs, an offense for which he will likely soon stand trial. Others who have speculated on the matter maintain that, while the discovery of Tracy Genero's body on the Silver Creek property certainly seems incriminating, there is little evidence to connect Curtis Sagmoen with the other missing women of the Northern Okanagan, aside from the proximity of their disappearances to his parents' property. Both Caitlin Potts and Ashley Simpson, some have pointed out, are known to have fought with their boyfriends just prior to their disappearances, and according to every major study conducted on the subject, more than half of all murdered women are killed by their romantic partners. In a similar vein, some armchair detectives have observed that the case of Deanna Wirtz has many elements which distinguish it from its four counterparts. Indeed, it is the only recent missing person case in the Northern Okanagan in which the RCMP do not believe foul play was involved. Whatever the case, we can only hope that the truth prevails, that the families of Northern Okanagan's five missing women find the answers they deserve, and that justice, if justice indeed be warranted, is served. The missing women of the Northern Okanagan are not the only recent victims of the British Columbia Triangle. Over the past few years, a number of young men have disappeared from the other side of the interior plateau under very mysterious circumstances. We'll explore these strange cases next week in the fifth instalment of this six-part series on the British Columbia Triangle. <laughs>